Well, it's Johannes here for the first episode of our Packet Tuesday. Now, I did record an episode zero, part zero of four, pa of four Packet Tuesday. Just introduce the concept a little bit, what we'll be doing here. But if you haven't watched that, well, uh, Packet Tuesday is about packets. That's what uh, we'll be doing here. We'll analyze a packet sort of in depth. I'll start today uh, with a DNS feature and a couple of reasons why I did this. First of all, I like DNS. Uh, DNS is my favorite protocol. It's probably the real reason why I did something DNS related, but uh, there's a lot about DNS. So um, remember a week or so ago, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we did have an interesting open SSL vulnerability. And while it wasn't really DNS related, it sort of was related to a DNS feature, Punicode, how international characters are encoded in DNS. So I thought, hey, you know, let's look at a Punicode and international uh, character uh, packet in DNS and uh, maybe work with this a little bit, maybe dive a little bit into Punicode encoding. A uh, little spoiler alert here, I won't tell you all the details about Punicode because it's just too complicated, uh, but uh, hopefully get across some of the points why Punicode is not really something that's easy to deal with. Uh, so uh, let's switch over here uh, to my screen share. And uh, since it is all about packets, first thing I wanna do is make sure that I'm actually uh, collecting packets. So let me run TCP dump here. EN7 should be my interface. I'm running these on a Mac and I'll uh, actually show you a couple sort of Mac TCP dump tricks uh, later. Uh, so, okay, let's just listen on interface and write it to a file. Uh, whenever I collect packets of an experiment like this, I start out without any filters. Uh, you can always filter later and just the risk is too large that you would miss the packet you're really interested in. Uh, so, okay. Let's start this. And uh, now let me open up a browser here. Let me start with Safari and uh, go to a website that uses international uh, domain names. And here you see that um, fbi.gov Japanese slash index.biz. Let me just copy this over here uh, to a terminal window. And since we did the DNS lookup, I should be able to cancel out of this. So, okay. So this is the URL that I uh, looked at. And the domain name is actually here, this part, that's the domain name. Uh, so this is not a slash to indicate, hey, now that's where uh, the actual origin ends and the path starts. Uh, this is part of the domain name, that Japanese slash. Uh, let's look it up, uh, this Japanese slash. Let's go back. Let's go back here, Google for it. Uh, uh, let's do this here. Okay. Yep, this, yep, this is it. There are actually sort of two variants of it. There's like this katakana letter no, and then there is the half width version of it. Um, I believe I'm using the full width version here uh, in, in this particular example. Let me see here the Unicode code 30 Charlie Echo. You know, that's our Unicode code point uh, for this particular uh, character. Okay, yeah. so um, relatively generic uh, Japanese uh, character that we are using here. Now, okay, let's uh, take a look at what this looks like here uh, with uh, DNS. So let me get back here uh, to the packet capture. It's our packet capture. We now filter for port 53. And let me just cheat a little bit here and um, grab for that FBI part. And uh, then I add here a number. I believe this is a Mac TCP dump specific feature. Not 100% sure about this, but give it a try in your version of TCP dump. It adds the number of the packet uh, at the beginning of the line. Uh, you see here, so we have here packet number 35. You know, that would be the a lookup you know, uh, for uh, that particular host name, so the IPv4. Let's use this particular uh, packet. Uh, let me see if we got a response back here as well. 
And again, cheating here a little bit with that query ID. Yep. Yeah. So 35, 36. Actually, we've got an NX domain here uh, for some reason, uh, but it may have done the, F the IPv6 version of it. Uh, you can try it. That host name should actually uh, resolve uh, for you as well. So uh, you can try that out. Uh, but uh, anyway, yeah, so let's actually just use packet number 35 here uh, to filter just packet number 35. I am could use, like with dash C35, you see this often being used, I get the first 35 packets here. If you only want a packet 35, there's again a little Mac trick where I can tell TCPDump to skip the first 34 packets um, and then that way I only get a packet number uh, 35. So here I have that. And then let me just save this into a new uh, PCAP file. Oh, so a single packet in here. And that's what I'll uh, then publish with the video, uh, this PCAP file with this uh, particular single packet. So going forward, you can now follow along if you downloaded uh, this packet. Of course, always feel free to pause the video if you first have to download something or um, get something to help you or maybe look up uh, some uh, cheat sheet or something like this. Uh, you know, I don't mind. You know, I wouldn't even notice if uh, you are uh, pausing the video. Okay, so let's uh, read it back. Let's do the cap lex and let's do a cap a few Vs here so we get uh, quite a bit of details here about the payload. Uh, not really that much here in this example because it's just a simple query. Okay, so uh, now let's uh, dissect uh, this uh, particular uh, packet and uh, just switch over here. So let me put a little cheat sheet here. Uh, this is one that you can download from the SANS website. I'll use it here in the beginning, uh, not so much later because you see it sort of overlaps with things, but uh, just to show you a little bit the idea here. Uh, so in IPv4, our packets, the IP header, starts always with version 4. And so that's um, the first uh, byte here of our, of our IP header is, all, is typically 4 or 5. The 5 here is the header length. It's in 4 byte units. Everything in IPv4 is sort of in 4 byte units, you know, like your IP address are 4 bytes. So uh, what this means is we have version four, IP header length five, which really means it's 20 bytes long, our IP header. Okay, so now we can basically count through here. It's always 16 bytes per line. Then we have here 17, 18, 19, 20. So after between five, six and FF, this is where our IPv4 header ends. So we have that uh, marker here. But uh, let's see what else we got here in the IPv4 header. We got our um, type of service. That's the next byte here, 00. zero. Then we got our total length, 0047. Zero, zero, 40 is 64 plus 7. So that's, um, sorry. 71 uh, bytes here then uh, for our uh, total datagram size. Then we got our IP ID. So IP ID would then be here the 57 Bravo 9. So 57 Bravo 9. Then we got our fragmentation fields, which are all zero, which is kind of nice. That makes things a little bit easier and less confusing. And then we got our time to live here for zero. So that's 64 in decimal. And um, you may, of course, notice that some of these fields are also here being decoded uh, by a TCP dump. And uh, then we got our protocol, 1-1 one, one in hexadecimal, or uh, this is then you know, 17 UDP in, um, in decimal, 1-1 one, one in hexadecimal. We got our checksum, Sir Charlie 2-2. Two, two. So that's our checksum. And then we got our IP addresses. And now the cheat sheet gets a little bit too confusing because I have to push it up. So uh, let me just explain that here. So 10, 5, 1, 
uh, and then six uh, Charlie is 108. And then we got our destination IP 105156, which is 86. So this is our IPv4 header. And nothing really special about that. It's a perfectly normal IPv4 header. That destination IP, of course, is my uh, recursive resolver here uh, in my network. Next, we got the UDP header. Let me take a little bit of a different color here for that. So here's our UDP header. Starts with the source port. Well, here's the large source port here, starting with FF. Uh, and uh, we can see this here in 65,474. And then our destination port, our destination port 35, of course, no, uh, 53 in decimal. Then we do have our uh, UDP length. So that's uh, 3 times 16 plus 3, 3 times 16, 48 plus 3, 51. So 51 is the length of the UDP part of our packet, uh, which sort of makes sense because you know, the total datagram size was 71. We had uh, 20 bytes for uh, the IP header. So that leaves 51 uh, bytes for the UDP part. And then we got our UDP checksum. And our UDP header is always eight bytes. So this here concludes our UDP header, uh, header uh, meaning that the rest here, that's a DNS. So that's a DNS part of the packet. Okay, the DNS part starts with our query ID, basically a random number. Let me change uh, colors again here. And uh, then we have our flags. There's only one flag set here, that's pretty easy to analyze, this one, and that's the recursion desired flag. What this means is that my client here, uh, my laptop, where I open the browser, it um, basically asks the recipient, the receiving DNS server, hey, go out and find the answer for me. Uh, very typical behavior. Uh, that's you know why I refer to that DNS server as my recursive name server here in my network. Then we have how many queries, one query, how many answers, of course there are no answers yet, how many authority records, and how many additional records. Okay, these first 12 bytes, they are static, they're always the same length, they're always there if you need them or not. Like you see here, we don't have any answers here, so we still have to field, we just uh, set it uh, to zero. Next, we do have then the actual um, domain information, the, the host name that we're looking for. And uh, here you have sort of a very typical uh, encoding for DNS. Let me just uh, clean this up a little bit here. That we always have sort of the length of the label and then the value of the label. So our first label here is FBI. And of course, that's three bytes. So three bytes here for that. Uh, that's why we see a three. Then you have six, 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 two, six, nine. Uh, this is now, when I go back here, go here to the hexadecimal part. Yep, here we have 66F, 62B, Bravo, 69I, uh, India. So uh, this is basically here the FBI part is these three bytes. And you also see it here. Now, when you first see the hexadecimal part, you say, hey, there's a dot, and dot makes sense, or we, we spell it out as FBI dot, and then XN dash dash. Well, um, it's not a dot. It's one one. It means there are now 17 characters following. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So this is basically that index, that XNN index part. And then we have 03, 
and then we have bis, B-I-Z, and then we have a zero here at the end that tells us we are done. Yeah, so that's the end of our host name. And then we got one for that is an A record in the internet class. That's this one one here, uh, what we are looking for. So this is the query. But uh, what I really want to talk about is that weird character and how it is encoded. So let me just uh, clear this up here. And uh, this is this part here, you know, highlighted here in the uh, in the hexadecimal uh, representation back here. So these international domain names, they st always start with xn, dash, dash. Uh, this is um, also called of the, uh, the ICE or um, equivalent ASCII uh, character marker. It basically means that, hey, this particular host name may include international uh, characters. And then uh, we have something really weird. Sometimes referred to as a boot string. So if you would have asked me, nobody did, but if you would have asked me how do we encode a string like, you know, uh, something like, uh, you know, turf here with the uh, umlaut u. Uh, the way I would have done it is T, normal English character, then let's say a dash maybe, and then, you know, um, some representation of the umlaut U, and uh, then another dash, something like this, and then a V. Yeah. That's sort of how I would have probably done it. Uh, but this would have been highly inefficient. Uh, because now, like, what if we have multiple international characters? Uh, we need all these dashes here, we need all these delimiters. So uh, they came up with a more efficient way uh, to encode it. And the basic pattern here is we start uh, with xn dash dash. Then you have all the ASCII characters, then a dash, and then you have the international characters. Okay. But the international characters aren't at the end, they're like in the middle of the string. So what we do here is uh, we are not just listing the ASCII or Unicode uh, code point of the international characters, but instead what you have here is it's the Unicode code point multiplied with uh, the actual position. So the Unicode code point times the position. So in this example here, it would be the Unicode code point of uh, the uh, Japanese slash here uh, times three because, well, it goes to position three. Like the first tier in the beginning would be zero, one, two, three. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that would be our code point. Uh, that's at least the number we are trying to represent here. Great, so uh, that doesn't actually sound that dangerous and difficult, uh, but we don't see a number here. We see 634G. So how do we get from a number to then uh, 634G? How do we get from the one to the other? Um, well, the solution is base 36 encoding. This is uh, how the number is then converted, at least at first, into a string mm, that we see here. Okay, so we all know base 16 encoding, mm, hexadecimal. Mm, uh, we basically just have characters 0 through 9, and then we have A, B, C, D, E, F. So um, that's base 16 encoding. Uh, base 36, at least the way it's being used here, is similar but different. Why 36? Well, we have 26 characters, like letters, and then we have the numbers 0 through 9. That gives us 36 possible characters. 
uh, but uh, in base 36, the way it's done here with Punic code at least, we're using the other way around. So it's A through C, but it would be 0 through 25. Then we have 0 through 9, gets us 26 through uh, 35. And so from 0 to 35, here, 0 to 35, we have 36 different possible uh, characters. Great, okay, that doesn't sound really that difficult. So now instead of times 16, we do like a times 36 and um, everything would be good. That's too easy. And there's another problem. Uh, let's say I want to encode a character with a code point of 500. I'm ending up you know, probably with like a two letter, um, um, a two digit uh, base 36 um, representation. Um, then I want to do something a little bit larger and now I end up with a three digit representation. If I would encode this here, so basically what I would end up with is something like xn dash a, B, C, my English characters. Then I have my A, D, A, C, B for these two characters. I would have no way of telling where one character ends and the next one starts. It's my break here, here, or here. And that's where Punicode starts to get really complicated. Uh, what they're introducing is a threshold. And instead of just taking this character and making like A times 36 square, uh, sorry, here, just clean this up a little bit. You know. So instead of just uh, multiplying each character, you know, with whatever the base is here, 36 you know, square, and then uh, that's D, the base, you know, then this here would just be the character itself you know, and add them up. You know, sort of the way we basically do it like with base 60, 16 with hexadecimal and such. Uh, this doesn't work here. Instead, they're introducing sort of a threshold where if one of these digits exceeds a certain value, we know it now starts the next character. And to support that, we can't multiply them each sort of by the same base, but we sort of have to subtract that threshold also from the base. And this is where stuff really gets messed up. Um, this is now where um, mistakes are being made, uh, where there are some exceptions they're defining in the RFC. If you uh, really want to look then at these remaining uh, details, RFC 3492, uh, that would be the one to look at. Let me just pull it up here. And um, it defines this probably better than what I just did. Let's pull it up. So basically here, you know, for each one of your values, times the base, but you subtract that threshold from it. Uh, for for each character, and of course you have to define how you can come up with that threshold. And they have here some sort of examples uh, listed you know, f for this. Uh, but um, yeah, this is why Punicode is such a royal pain uh, to really decode, encode. Uh, browsers, I sh showed you uh, Safari earlier. Uh, Safari really loves to display everything in... Um, in Unicode or basically show you the, the actual uh, character. Uh, but um, Google Chrome actually is a little bit more careful here. Let me just uh, pull up the site that I showed you earlier uh, in uh, Google Chrome. First of all, Google Chrome tells you right away, hey, this site may be fake. And uh, I'm making no effort to get off that list with my test site here. Uh, and then it does display the actual uh, domain name here in Punicode. Now, to bring it back to uh, 
TLS and uh, let me just show you the certificate for uh, this particular domain. It has a valid certificate here and maybe a little bit small here depending on what the resolution is but it's actually a wildcard certificate I was able to get here from Let's Encrypt uh, for this particular domain so it works for various domains but the the name in the certificate is actually impunicode code encoded uh, where OpenSSL had issues with that of course you may also have email addresses as part of the certificate and email addresses uh, may contain international characters as well. And actually not just as the domain name, but also as part of the actual username part. So the part in front of the ad. And um, then there are a couple other sort of issues that are often done not quite right, or uh, you may run to uh, problems with Punicode. Like, uh, first of all, you know, um, let me just sort of a test, you know, test. You know example.com. Uh, this domain only has uh, English characters and it is actually sort of valid here the way uh, it is encoded. Uh, let's just see what comes up in the browser here when I plug this in. Yeah, it doesn't resolve yeah, which is probably good. Uh, let's see. comes back so if you're enterprising maybe you can still register uh, that uh, domain name and uh, see what happens also what if you have multiple dashes then in the end so if you have something like xn example dash abc dash def dot com uh, there's supposed to be only one dash here. Typically, what the way it should be read the RFC is read the RFC is that everything to the last single dash is supposed to be English characters. Now, dashes in domain names is sort of a little bit an iffy issue anyway, and you see here why kind of because we sort of use them here as special characters as part of puny code encoding and also uh, in uh, other circumstances. But um, anyway, so. Um, this is what I want to show you here. Like I said, the uh, packet capture uh, that I just had, that one packet, a single packet, uh, will be attached to the video in some form. Still working out all the details and uh, also links to the uh, links to the cheat sheets and such. I'll probably add them as well, as well as to the RFC. If you have any comments and such, uh, then actually let me just uh, put my email address here. If you need to reach me, uh, this address jolrich at dot edu, and uh, that'll basically um, allow you to send me send me whatever kind of feedback. Want me to do it different, less in depth, less in depth. Look at this, and I definitely do accept packet donations. Hope you like it. Subscribe, recommend it to your friends, enemies, whoever family. Thanks.